Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking your time to join us today for the Particle Physics for Teachers uh, webinar. Now, today with us, uh, we have uh, Michael, and he's also our scientist ambassador from uh, France. He's uh, going to show you uh, bits and tricks about particle physics today, and he's going to present you his uh, new course. Now, before I give the floor to, to Michael, I would like to ask uh, everyone, as usual, to sign the signature list that my colleague Diego will, will now uh, share with you in the chat. Hello, everyone, and hello again, Ivana, and thanks for uh, welcoming me here for the, this webinar. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to do these. And this one I asked a little bit last minute, so I'm especially grateful that you managed to organize things and put things together. And grateful for everyone who's joined for this, both because it was a bit short notice and because particle physics is a bit of a niche topic. So I'm really excited that so many of you have turned out for this one. Um, to say hi and welcome, I'm going to try something I've wanted to do for a lot of my other webinars, but got kind of nervous and felt bad that like I'm going to miss out on some greetings and stuff. So I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to try and say hello in a number of European greetings. Please let me know which ones I either terribly mispronounce or forget. Um, but I'm in Spain, so uh, buenas tardes, uh, bon tarde, uh, bonjour, uh, bueno, uh, got lost already. Uh, um, hello, guten tag, guten tag, dobre dan, gen dobre, ahoy, calimera, perchendetje, mahraba. Probably all I got for the moment because I got lost. And I even forgot in my own language. Um, but welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, it's great to see a number of uh, familiar faces. Isn't the right word? Familiar names in the chat uh, for a bunch of people I know. So it's kind of like joining a bunch of old friends and getting to meet new ones. Because some of you know me already, the first question I'm going to ask you in the chat is for those of you who know me already, where's the last place you saw me? And if you didn't see me, you can just write never in the chat. But it, it'll be interesting to see because I'm seeing people I know I've seen a couple of days ago in Madrid, a week or two ago in Bulgaria, different places. So take a moment. Uh, and if you've seen me either at a Scientix event online or in person in the last couple of months, ooh, someone from CERN 2018. I wonder if that's Marco or if that's Scott or someone who didn't say they were coming. And there's a couple of places you might have seen me before. Uh, I'm no stranger to Scientix events. Here's a list of a number of the webinars and different events I presented in the past couple of years. Uh, there's also a number of places that, uh, and it is Scott. Scott's joining all the way, I think, from Washington State, maybe from somewhere in the United States. So that's, that's great. We have people getting up in the morning. It's like 7.30 in the morning there. Um, so a great way to start your day. Um, so a couple other places that some of you might have seen me recently, I run a monthly experiment share meeting for teachers to share experiments. I'll mention that briefly at the end of the presentation, give a link for anyone who's not yet involved with that. And I've been performing science shows all around the world in 21 countries and counting uh, just since the summer before this one, summer 2022. And most recently, I've been at five different national science on stage festivals either participating in their jury or uh, performing extracts from my new particle detective show that I've been developing with CERN. And this month I'm featured in the American Physics Society news uh, with a news article there. So check that out as well if you're not familiar with some of the stuff I do yet. It, it's been a fun, uh, fun past couple of months or so. But what am I talking about here today? So as Ivana mentioned, and as the title kind of indicates, Particle Physics for Teachers, it's a free online course I'll be running over the next month and a half or so, uh, starting next week, going tentatively to the 20th of December, although I'm still waiting to hear about an extra session I might add on. Teaching a particle physics topic. I'm trying to make an introduction to particle physics that should be fun, simple, and accessible, no matter what level you're teaching. Although for, for kindergarten, like it might be limited to me directing you to the Atlas Coloring Book, the CMS Activity Book, and like I don't have that many ideas for five or six-year-olds, but uh, hopefully for almost anyone else, there will be um, something for you there. But uh, that's a lot about me. 
now in the chat, I'd like you guys to tell me a little bit more about yourselves. So I have a bit of an idea who you're ta who I'm talking to. So please indicate either if you're a teacher, what level you teach approximately. If you're a scientist, because I know I invited some particle physicists to come along, check this out. They may or may not be here. Um, or if you're someone else completely, like you might be a random friend of mine who decided to come along or something like that. Uh, I know I've had an ex who's come along to a couple of things like this. Um, so feel free to share if that's uh, if that's your story. So it's great. We, we've got a mix of different subjects and different levels, which was exactly what I was hoping for. Um, and like I said, I'm trying to aim the course kind of for all different levels. Another question um, that I'm interested in, uh, so please answer in the chat as well. Uh, please let me know what the main reason you signed up for the webinar is, whether it's that you love particle physics, you love scientists, you love me. I mean, that's, that's what I'm hoping everyone's answer is, uh, or something completely different. And that helps me judge kind of what the motivation is too uh, for people who hopefully, after you see this, will continue and will follow the course. And so then if you do, I need to know whether I should focus mostly on talking about myself or mostly about particle physics or try and pull in scientists more through the whole thing. Okay, I see I'm getting a lot of love. People, people love me and that's why they're joining. And I'll, I'll just leave it maybe 20 more seconds to see as more answers come in, because I, I always like seeing what uh, you guys are saying. Oh, and one thing to note for the, the course itself, so as I'm waiting for more answers to come in and hear from you guys, for the course itself, I'll be running it via Zoom. There will likely be significantly less people uh, than for the webinar, because me not being an organization or scientists, you know, having as much of a pull, we're probably not going to have as much people, so it'll be a more intimate group, and you'll be able to actually talk to me. You'll be able to use your microphone, hopefully use your camera if you're not shy, so we'll be able to interact more directly than just with the chat. Um, so I'll try and encourage as much interaction as possible as we go. Hi, Michael. Just to interrupt you shortly, um, because this webinar is being recorded, we were not uh, allowed to for everyone to show their microphones and cameras. Uh, so yeah, the it's going to have to be through chat, unfortunately. <laughs> oh yeah, no, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to complain. It's it's also with the numbers <laughs> of people we have, like having a group of more than sixty people, it gets a bit crazy with that. So, so like, sorry if they came off as a complaint. I was I wasn't meaning it uh, as a criticism that way at all. It's just, um, uh, yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought on no, that. No, no, um, don't worry. <laughs> we just wanted to say that if anyone has any questions, they can always just use the the chat. No worries. Oh, which reminds me too, please do ask or point out things anytime they come up in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on the chat, but I also kind of get busy focusing on my slides and what I'm saying and the next thing I'm going to say. So if I miss anything, either just like repeat it, repeat it in capital letters, or we'll get to it at the end as well. Um, but like most of you, I'm a teacher. I've been a teacher for years. I'm used to being interrupted. Uh, I welcome interruptions because often they lead to a, a tangent that's something more interesting than I had planned to say anyways. Uh, so please do uh, jump on and write as many things uh, as you can. Uh, but with that, getting into the story of why I'm running a particle physics for kids, uh, for teachers course, uh, the story starts back during the pandemic. I was running virtual science camps. I've presented those on a couple of science uh, scientists webinars. So some of you might be familiar with them. But once we were back in school, in France at least, in 2021, I missed running these camps where I had kids from all over the world joining in each Zoom session. So I decided to pick my favorite themed ones and invite a bunch of scientists to come for particle physics for kids for a themed set of camps. But I didn't want it to just be visits. I wanted to get kids doing experiments around the home. So I alternated experimental sessions, which you see in the left on blue, with scientific sessions led by a scientist at a research facility around the world. That went well, and that kind of laid the framework for the plan for this particle physics for teachers course. In 2022, I uh, ran the same course again. By the end of it, and some of you on this uh, webinar are now joined for it as well, uh, you, might, you might remember near the end, Sometimes we had reasonably low attendance in some of the sessions, but also we tended to have more teachers than we had uh, kids at the end. 
And that got me thinking, it's worth really organizing something like this aimed at teachers rather than just aimed at kids, but still at a particle physics at a kid level so that teachers can teach kids particle physics or pass things on to that. Um, but I decided to take my time and plan it, reflect, talk to a lot of different stakeholders rather than just rushing into it, which is why it's a year and a half later. Finally, I'm excited to announce particle physics for teachers. Um, so a couple of things like the, what I'm trying to accomplish with this, with this and with a number of other projects, including Particle Detectives, which is a low cost particle physics science show that I've been performing now in seven countries and counting since September. Uh, the idea is to make particle physics more fun, more accessible to people, uh, making it interesting for people, trying to gain confidence in teaching particle physics uh, topics, and especially, and this is going to be my next slide, bridging the gap between researchers and teachers, because there's an, a number of kind of areas of disconnection that I've had the occasion to think about uh, for a while. You'll notice on the left here, there's a couple of pictures, which are slides from when I was invited to present at the American Physics Society conference a year and a half ago. And it was on problems getting outreach into formal education or problems with teachers in schools not being interested and not using different educational materials that, in that case, members of the American Physics Society were developing, but more generally that scientists at research centers were uh, developing. And there's a number of problems with this. One will be familiar probably to most of you. Anytime a politician in your country starts talking about education or there's education reform, and it's that most people have gone to school at some point in their life, usually as a kid. You know. And then when they grow up, they're an adult who's gone to school and they assume from their years in school that they're an expert at school and that teachers don't really know any more about school than they do because they, they've also gone to school. But they're missing out on the intent and the planning and the years of practice. And so as all of you or almost all of you will know, after even a couple of years of teaching where you're the adult, you're planning the lesson, you have an overall view of things, then you have a lot better perspective and a lot more skills than just the kids going through schools. So there's this fallacy that most adults assume that they know as much about school as teachers do, whereas usually they don't. Um, that's also the case for scientists, but they also have the, the issue where scientists, if they're doing outreach, they'll often give talks or they'll prepare activities. But often, and this varies a lot from one person to another, it would often be once a month, a couple times a year, some amount of time where they can give the same talk essentially over and over, and they can take several weeks to prepare it. Whereas teachers, generally, you need to be giving a lesson on several different subjects every day, day after day. So the preparation or where you look for resources is completely different from that. And so there tends to be this big disconnect and you'll have big facilities, like in the case of particle physics, you'll have places like CERN coming up with educational resources that sometimes they'll work well, but sometimes they won't uh, actually fit the needs of what they're trying to do. And so one of my goals in this course is to try and you know go in between with my experience and with my contacts with wonderful people like you uh, and make it so that like what's being done and a lot of the work that is being done by researchers is, is great to share their work. And it's just like one tiny thing that's missing to make it relevant for the, the classroom. Um, to go over the plan, and th this is a very visually boring slide. I'm, I'm sorry for that. It, I mean, it's a schedule, so maybe I should have added more color. But for, for this one, like I find that the content is interesting, but the vi <laughs> looking at it, I don't know, I'll, I'll put this on the, the course website. I, I was working on the schedule today and just finalized it uh, today. Actually, I'm realizing looking at it, I finalized the date for Marco's session and didn't tell Marco. So 
<laughs> and I think he's on this. So Marco, we, I chose Monday. Hopefully that's still good. Uh, if not, text me afterwards and we'll switch it to Thursday, which was the other option. Um, so yeah, getting everything in together last minute. But I'm going to take a couple of minutes to overview what to expect for each session because I'm really impressed with this lineup, both of teachers that I've gotten, like amazing teachers who I've met from around the world, and some of the scientists I have lined up, and some people who you could sit, consider kind of in between. Um, so to kick things off next week, so the first like session of the course is gonna be on Tuesday at six, and it's with my friend and mentor, Anya Horvat. And I met her at CERN, she was um, the, PhD student uh, helping out Jeff Weiner for teacher programs at the time. And at the time she was researching her PhD, which is on evaluating the impact of teacher programs. So she's been a great help, not only for a number of other things, but like preparing this course, Particle Physics for Teachers. She's written a detailed thesis on evaluating particle physics courses for teachers. Like, She's amazing for that. But not only that, uh, about two years ago, uh, she realized her dream of having CERN actually formally hire her for what she does in science communications and science shows. And she's the main developer or, or manager of science shows at, at, at Science Gateway. Um, you can see there's a picture of her showing me around the antimatter factory back in 2019. But she's one of the most amazing people I know. And so I'm, I'm, especially happy to kick off the course with her. Uh, the next session will be me running it, which either is the best session of all or the least interesting session of all. But um, there's a number of things that I want to cover that like most things I can bring in someone who's even better than me at it. But the overall idea of the course, goals of it, how we're going to bring things into the classroom. I want to run at least one of the sessions myself so that I mean, that's um, um, uh, the, the next week, uh, there's Steve Goldfarb, and you'll notice I listed him as the Canada's blues band lead singer, which he is, and he's amazing. He's a, he's a great jazz singer, but he also does a number of things in particle physics and particle physics outreach. He used to be the co-chair of the International Particle Physics Outreach Group. He's been on the Atlas experiment for about two decades in various different roles, um, he knows everyone there is to know in particle physics. Uh, he was my scientific advisor um, for a number of particle physics projects. Um, and just all around amazing guy. But when, when he sent me his bio this morning, it finished with, most importantly of all, he's the front man for the Ken Arts Blues Band. So that, that's all I listed in like the written description of who Steve is there. Following Steve, uh, there's Marco, who I, I think is on this call, and I met him in 2018 at CERN as well. And at a teacher program at CERN, there's a couple of different types of people. And of the people who seem to be experts at particle physics, like who know much more than I do, and I'm, I'm running a course on it, so I know a fair bit, there's some people who like to point out that they know everything. And then there's guys like Marco who, don't point things out to, to make others feel that, you know, not to show what they know, but when you get to talking to them, I realize Marco knows an incredible amount of it, uh, about all of it. And it was only near the end of my time there, like one of my last days, we started talking about how we teach things in class. And he started telling me about how he uses bubble chambers and, and tracks from bubble chambers. And this was at the end of two weeks of lectures and visits at CERN. And it was only talking to Marco near the very end of it, where things kind of clicked. And I understood about traces particles we're making. And so I was really eager to share that with other people. Uh, there's a couple of screenshots from when he shared that on Particle Physics for Kids last year, the year before. Um, but I'm, I'm really amazed to have him uh, come back and share this. And the plan is like, We'll have Steve showing around Atlas, which is a big detector. Marco showing uh, how detectors work or how we can interpret the traces. And then the next session uh, with Jesus Porta Pelé, who I'm actually staying with right now in Madrid. He's the head of the outreach department at CMAT, which is um, a 
National Research Lab uh, in Spain, where I was lucky enough to spend the past two days. And he'll be going into detail about a muon telescope, which is one of the sub detectors of the CMS detector, uh, detector at CERN, and the idea of gas detection. And then, like through the whole course, how I'm trying to do, alternating between scientists and teachers, something at like top level theoretical stuff, and then something you can actually use in the classroom. Then my friend uh, Federico Andrioletti, um, who the, there's a photo of us together at CERN this past summer. He was on the teacher programs and I was there. I guess I was meeting with Anya to. Uh, I should have remembered how to finish that sentence. I was going to say to finalize uh, particle detectives, but it wasn't final at all. Then I was preparing before my first uh, performance of it in Kazakhstan a week later. Uh, but anyways, when I saw Federico over the summer and visited him in Italy, one of the many things he showed me was a homemade radon detector, which is a, like a, a basic gas detector. And it's one that you can make. You can see the materials there, like it's made out of a coffee can and tape and you can't see the transistors and wires inside. But it's something I've been eager to take the time to make myself. But I've been doing a lot of different things and haven't made one myself. So if I don't before that session, I'm really looking forward to him talking us through it. Uh, and then just a really fun photo that I wanted to share that's not a particle physics one is the beer bottle thermometer at the at the right there. And those who who know me well or have seen a lot of my experiments have probably seen me share this uh, this experiment. And um, when I got to Federico's lab, he showed me this one he'd made years ago when he first uh, I forget whether it was from my YouTube channel or from a Scientix webinar. Because I think one of my first Scientix webinars, like two and a half years ago, I shared this experiment as well. But he made one that he was still using to this day. And it was it was amazing meeting someone like who I'd met after he was doing one of my experiments and showing something that he had made before we met. Um, so it was it was uh, you know quite special. But I'm I'm really looking forward to having him on. And then finishing with a bang, this is. This is the only guest host who I haven't personally met yet, but she's one of the most amazing people I've I've virtually met via Zoom. Um, so Claire, um, she's also an avid cyclist. So, uh, I mean, that's off topic for this webinar, but my last Scientix webinar in February, I, I held while I was biking across the Sahara from Morocco to Senegal. Uh, she's right now in South Africa and she's biked around different sections of Africa. Um, I forget where else she's she's cycled. Uh, but when I first met her like online, Steve, who's doing the Atlas tour, introduced us earlier this summer. And when I looked at uh, what she was up to, I concluded that she was a more successful female version of myself, um, which then she was kind enough to say uh, something along the lines of, don't go by what other people judge success by. I think what you're doing is great too. Uh, so amazing person uh, who's done a lot of stuff, but she's going to do her her uh, her famous talk on the t uh, triumphant discovery of the Higgs boson, which is a great way to to finish off the course. Uh, but it's not quite done yet because we also need to uh, finish with resources. What else can you use to to share particle physics with students? So we've got a whole team of three people from CERN Science Gateway to present a number of their different uh, resources. Um, it's kind of a more detailed plan through the session of which types of resources they're going to show, but um, I'll fill you in more on that when you sign up for that, because um, I've got more slides and a couple more things I want to talk about. Uh, there's also two more sessions. Oh, yeah, just before I get to that. Also, two more sessions in the works that aren't confirmed yet, so I haven't included them on the schedule I've shared. But one is on a positron emission tomography, so like PET, medical. Uh, I'm sure it's medical imaging they're doing. I, I've got to check with the possible guest host for that session. I, I'm fairly confident it's imaging rather than tumor treatment, but it's going through a virtual lab for students for that. So uh, Sarah at um, I guess she's at Gateway. She's part of the CERN education team. Um, uh, we've been emailing back and forth and we're just looking for a date. So hopefully that'll be a session too, but didn't include a slide because 
still being confirmed. Same with Dave Fish at the Perimeter Institute. Um, emails have gone back and forth. I've met with Tanya, their head of outreach. We're keen on the idea. We haven't found a date yet. If we do, it's going to be on the schedule and you'll get to see Perimeter Resources as a nice send off as well. If not, I'll include at least one or two of them in the session I run myself next week because they're they're by far the world's best resources for topics like particle physics. So the course wouldn't be complete without stuff from Perimeter. So I, either from them showing it or me showing it, there will be some Perimeter stuff. Uh, okay, the other two things I wanted to talk about. So I mentioned this earlier. Uh, Particle Detectives is a low-cost portable science show that I've been developing in collaboration with CERN Science Gateway. I mentioned Anya, who will be uh, giving the intro to particle physics and CERN, uh, and CERN, in addition to her research and all the stuff she does on particle physics and curriculum, uh, teaching, uh, teacher training, designing programs for students. She also develops science shows, and she's the science show lead at Science Gateway. So she's been overseeing the de uh, my development of a low-cost version of her shows there. Uh, one of the, like, uh, things we agreed on was in addition to like developing the idea for the show, I'd test it out. So I've been traveling around mainly to national science on stage festivals uh, across Europe and beyond, like Kazakhstan, Bulgaria, France, uh, Serbia. Uh, and just two weeks ago, I was at Ciencia en Acción, which is the festival where they select the Spanish national team from, and I was on the jury for that too. Um, Anyways, in all these different countries, I've been testing out, making modifications, performing at primary schools, secondary schools, even two universities, one winery, um, science festivals, too, like different crowds to try and get uh, feedback and assess what works, what doesn't work, uh, switching things out depending on how hard they are to procure in different countries. Uh, and how how well they travel. Uh, for example, they well, I'll, yeah, I'll I'll show an experiment in a minute and ex explain the story behind it. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the story behind that one. And the the idea is once I send Anya the script and the how to guide, so where to find materials for the experiments, how to put the things together, so that anyone should be able to do the show themselves. Whether any of you want to do it in your school or whether someone wants to do it at like an outreach event, like European Researchers Night <clears throat> or a science festival. The idea is there should be enough material in the guide and in the script that anyone can download it from the CERN website, like the CERN either gateway or education website, uh, and use it uh, for events wherever, wherever you're doing it. That all depends on it actually being accepted and the back and forth of the drafts and stuff. I have no reason to think it wouldn't be, but that's why I say it should rather than it will uh, be published. Uh, but that should happen. Ho hopefully it'll go quickly. I should have things sent off to Anya this week or next. We're hoping to have things uh, approved by the end of the month. And then I don't know how long it takes to publish, but like, yeah, some sometime after that. Um, but I also have a page with brief information, links to a couple of photos and videos on the show. Um, once, once it's ready, uh, I'm happy to be invited anywhere, either to perform or to train people or both, or to do other like workshops, either in particle physics or I've gotten a little bit discouraged from particle physics lately. So also general science, which is kind of uh, what I'm more used to anyways. Um, so please invite me to different places. Um, with that, now I'm going to say it's experiment time. So I'm going to show my, yeah, my favorite experiment from this show uh, and uh, give a little bit of a backstory behind it. So like I mentioned earlier, I was at CERN in August. Well, I was also at CERN in July and in June, but only for like a week each time. It's not like I was living there, anything like that. Um, but I was there in August uh, and I was preparing for my first performance of uh, Particle Detectives uh, in Kazakhstan at the beginning of September at the Science on Stage Kazakhstan Festival. And I was I was talking with the Science on Stage coordinator for Kazakhstan, Yerlin, 
uh, about the show and I was saying, yeah, I've got this new show I'm developing on particle physics. And, you know, it's mainly just about how the world is made of particles. There's not that much detail on the experiments themselves. Um, but I'd really like to have my first performance be at your festival. And he thinks about it and he says, eh, particle physics, that that's pretty boring. Um, can't you do something like you did last year or like, can't you do something else like, there's going to be kids. We want fire and explosions and stuff. And of course, my my first reaction was, you just want fire and you don't want real science. I, that's not me. I, I don't want to do that. But then I thought about it a bit and I thought about how I was adapting on your show, Seeing the Invisible, that really was about how we can use science to see phenomena that aren't immediately visible. And how the flame test uh, for having colored flame to tell us what kind of ions are present is a way of seeing something that's otherwise invisible. So yeah, I guess I can do a color fire tornado. So that's the experiment I'm going to show here. I, I did share it on my monthly experiment share two months ago. So if you're one of the 20 or so people who are on that, I mean, there's 60 people on the call, more than half of you probably haven't seen this yet. Sorry if you've seen this already. Maybe I've improved it since then. Um, but it's the reason why I've been traveling around with a garbage can. Uh, and as I start setting up the experiment, you'll see. And I'm uh, yell at me or like, I Ivana, tell me if you can't hear me now that y yes, you can still yeah. hear me without that. Oh, good. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, but I can't hear you because my volume is off. Well, I could barely hear you. Now I can hear you. Can you hear, can me, now? hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, so perfect. So I've been traveling around with this uh, trash can. And this actually isn't the original one from Kazakhstan. This is a replacement one I got in Bulgaria, which is way too big because I've been traveling around with this backpack and it barely fits. And it's the hugest hassle to try and fit it in. And I bend it out of shape and now it's getting broken. So I'm going to retire this trash can. I probably will leave it in Madrid. I, I'm not sure. Anyways, uh, I've got a trash can. I've got a Frisbee. This is actually an old Canada Frisbee that I bought at a dollar store about 20 years ago. And I've used as a cutting board when traveling on several trips. Hundreds of people have eaten off of it at picnics over the years. Um, but it's going to be used as a roller below the trash can. And Ivana, jump on if like the framing is wrong. But I think how I can see it, you can see the Frisbee just at the bottom of the trash can, right? We can. We can. We can. We can. We can. Perfect. So now I have a rotating reference frame, which will be important for the next part of the experiment. For the next part of the experiment, I'm going to be using three different white powders. And these white powders on camera shouldn't appear significantly different. In person, unless you look really close, they won't look that different either. But they're common, cheap household substances. One is just good old sodium chloride, so table salt. Another is potassium chloride, low sodium salt, or at least that's what it's often marketed as. And this one is boric acid, which I'm told is used as ant poison. Um, I've never actually bought it myself. This was given to me from a friend, but you should be able to get it at either hardware stores or pharmacies, like wh whichever store does pest control in your country. In, in Spain, you tend to get like permethrin and boric acid at a pharmacy, if I understand correctly. In France, that's more of a specialized pest control store. But like, anyway, some kind of store that does that. Uh, just some uh, pie dishes um, as like a burner. My first several times I did this, I was using beer cans and like turning them upside down or cutting them off to have them lower. So if you don't want to buy pie tins, like if you're in a country that doesn't make individual pies or that it's hard to procure soft drinks and beer uh, comes in a can that works quite well for this as well the cans are a little bit smaller so it's easier to control and here's just um uh alcohol it's it's ethyl alcohol from a pharmacy for like disinfecting wounds uh and this was 96 percent. so i've just prepared a bottle here where i've added a little bit of water uh, and that's just because these salts, they're not particularly soluble in ethanol. So adding a little bit of water helps them dissolve a bit. Technically, they don't really need to dissolve if it, the flame gets hot enough and it gets it to evaporate. But like, 
it works better if they dissolve a bit. So it, it's good if the ethanol is about 70 to 80 percent. It's, it's not a very exact thing. Um, so just in each of these, I'm going to put one of the kinds of salt. And it's not an exact amount, it's just some. If you want it to work well the first time, give it a little bit of excess, like these salts are all cheap. Um, but if you're traveling and getting low on materials, you can skip on them and it works pretty well too. Um, one note about the ethanol. So I'm using ethanol now because it's much easier to buy and much safer to use. However, if you're in a situation where it's easy to get, and safe to use and you're comfortable using it, methanol works significantly better, largely because the salts will dissolve better in methanol, but also because it naturally has a colorless flame. So the flame color will be significantly more apparent. Um, but there's a lot of reasons to avoid methanol. So don't go saying that I said, yeah, you have to use methanol. No, like I'm, I'm showing it with ethanol. And one of the reasons I often show it with ethanol is because I would encourage people, unless you really know what you're doing, don't start messing around with methanol. It's kind of nasty stuff. Okay, so I've added a little bit of the 70 to 80% eth uh, ethanol in the bottom of the container. Now I've got them loaded up into the rotating reference frame. And I just have some uh, aluminum foil at the bottom of it to help prevent them sliding around. I, I tried a couple of different iterations of things. Like at one point I was using elastic bands to hold it together. But the problem with elastic bands is they melt when it gets hot, so it, it wasn't so good either. Uh, and now I'm just gonna add a little bit of excess ethanol. And the reason for that is because I want things to get nice and hot so it'll burn a little bit better. Um, and so that we'll get the solvent just working on the lights. Okay. So it's a little bit darker here so that we'll get. Okay. So there we can see um, the flame is reasonably big, not yet colored. And that's why I was saying I wanted to have an excess amount uh, of ethanol because the ethanol, if I turn this here, you can see I intentionally spilled some by the bottom. So it's getting the containers hot. And as they get hotter, then it'll both encourage the uh, salts to dissolve, but also the ions to dissociate. But also the hotter the ethanol is, the faster it evaporates, the bigger the flame gets. From my point of view, I can see the boron one starting to go green, but I'm going to start spinning this. So then we can get it to spin around kind of as a fire tornado, which is the more impressive part of it. And the reason we get it like tornadoing or <laughs> spinning around as a tornado is that as the flame sucks in air from the side and it goes through the container, then it gets a sideways force on it, so it's spinning, but angular momentum is conserved. So as it goes closer in, it accelerates and moves faster and faster. So it actually blows on the flame and we get significantly higher flames this way. And now as things have gotten hotter and it's starting to go down, we should be able to see the different colors. I'm, I'm looking at the camera and it seems a bit more orange than in person. Uh, Ivana, can you confirm or deny that we can kind of at least a bit see the green color of the I boron? See, I see just, just a tiny, tiny bit. bit. Okay, I'll, I'll have a hard time spinning it as well, but I'll try and do the above view, which kind of makes it a little bit. That was not good. Am I still with you guys? Yes, yes, yes you, are, you, are, you are. Okay. So I need to be a bit more careful with the top view. And if I try and spin it with the top view, this is going to be a bit of a mess. But hopefully that's a little bit more apparent. Now we can, now see, we can the see the green. OK. And, and as, it, as it gets lower and lower, then the concentration of the salts gets higher. Also, it's hotter, so we see more dissociation. But um, we're getting green, which is the spectral color of boron. We're getting lilac, the spectral color of potassium. 
And the sodium went out. The sodium is the least interesting. So I had the, uh, the least uh, ethanol in there because I like, I kind of wanted it to die out first because it's kind of nice seeing the, the more interesting colors at the end. And these fairly shortly are gonna die out as well. And so that's just an example of one of the experiments in, included in the show. And the idea of the show is going from particles in the air, moving down to electrons, what electrons are doing. This is the electrons in the atoms that are um, making photons of different colors uh, and, and so on. Then ending just with a, a model of what happens inside of a particle detector, like inside of a scintillator. Um, but I only want to take time to show one of my experiments for the show for this. And this was the one that was kind of like the new exciting one that I hadn't been doing before this year. Uh, also, as I mentioned, I think on my slide for the show, uh, these uh, experiments in so far as possible, I've used inspiration from different people I've met around the world, similar as I've been doing with my favorite experiments or with my previous show, Experiments World Tour. So this one was one that I learned from a teacher in California, uh, right near the start of when I started biking around looking for experiments in the summer of 2018, uh, David Holler. Uh, and he, di he didn't show me it using three colors of flame together. I, I should show him a video of this uh, just to feed back on that. Um, but that that's uh, that one. Oh, now that I'm done showing the experiment, I only now realized we didn't turn off my slides so everyone had a bigger view of it, right? We forgot to do that part. Right. Right. Oh, why didn't anyone tell us? Oh, but I, but uh, I think... I think it'll still, still be visible, visible even, if, even it's smaller. if it's small. Yeah, and if if people are like me, well, except when I'm presenting, I'm focused on presenting, so I'm not doing it. But like, if I'm watching something, then I um, switch around views and I like I get it to be as big as possible, even if the presenter hasn't remembered to do that. So hopefully, some people try to remember to do that. Anyways. Uh, that was that experiment. Now there's only one last thing I want to mention before my last slide. And that's if you're not yet aware and coming to my regular monthly uh, experiment share meetings, these now this month, it's two years since I started doing the doing it on a regular monthly basis. And it's always a great, um, great way to meet up and share experiments with other teachers. Typically, there's five to ten of us who end up presenting something. I mean, it varies a lot one month or another. And there's usually teachers from like 10 or 15 countries who show up. Um, so if you're not yet joining, please join. The next one is right near the end of the month, uh, Tuesday, November 28th. There's a link to sign up for it. Uh, the, the links, the, um, like, don't bother copying the whole link or anything. There's a link to all of these slides and you just click on the links that interest you and, uh, and whatnot. The next slide, which I'll go to, but then go back to, has all of the links, including a link to the slides. So like, you know, finishing with the idea of the experiment share. Uh, hopefully you guys show up and uh, join that project. So now uh, finishing on the last slide with all the links and how you can join in the fun. Um, so, to recap, Particle Physics for Teachers, that's the free online course starting next week, running until December 20th, or maybe a day or two later, depending if Perimeter wants to present their resources like a couple days after that. Um, there's a mailing list for the course. Unfortunately, I didn't get around to opening a registration for the, the sessions yet, and that's because even just today when preparing for this webinar, I was finalizing some of the dates, emailing or like WhatsApping back and forth with people. Uh, and so because I didn't have the dates, I didn't want to open registration. It would have been great if I said, okay, you could just register it. Instead, there's a mailing list, which is one more form to fill out. I'm, I'm sorry. I wanted to have the registration open for today. It just didn't happen. It, it'll be open Thursday or Friday. And if you're on the mailing list, you'll get an email. If you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you'll see a message there. Or if you're on my mailing list for experiment share meetings, you'll get another message there. So there's ways to be informed. Sorry, the registration isn't open yet. It, it is what it is. Uh, hopefully you're interested in my particle, phys uh, particle detective show. There's more information on that. I'm always happy to go new places. Um, please invite me somewhere. 
Uh, please join us for the experiment share meeting two weeks from, yeah, two weeks exactly from today. Um, and if you don't want to type in all the things for those, then uh, we should be able to put the link for the slides in the chat. Um, so then you can get all the slides like that. Um, so I think that's everything I wanted to say, and I think that's on time to have time for questions, right, Ivana? That's exactly that's right. exactly yep. Yeah. Perfect. So hopefully people have questions or or comments as well, things you want to say. Uh, please let us know if you do. Yes, just yes, just feel free to write in the chat. And also, I wanted to just mention something about the slides. Uh, as Michael said, you have the link here, and my colleague Diego will also help and uh, paste uh, the link in the chat. But also, since you all signed the signature list, we will be sharing it uh, by email too. So just in case you you couldn't make it and download it right now. Um, yeah, as Michael said, uh, well, first, uh, thank you for the lovely presentation and the amazing experiment that you did. But now, as, uh, as we said, it's time for questions. So in case uh, you have any, just feel free to, to write uh, in, in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, uh, while you're all writing, I wanted to, to ask Michael perhaps to share uh, his favorite uh, memory, uh, his favorite experiment or the time where he had to go somewhere and present. Uh, I'm sure people would love to hear that. Ah, sorry, you're muted. I, I said that that sounds like a great question. Um, there's so many experiments that I love. Can I can I give two answers for that? <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay. So so one. Oh, and I oh I should have had material handy. I think I do. It's one I've shown on a on a Scientix webinar before. But I'll look for the material for it as I'm explaining the other one. So. The, the first one I'm going to mention is the beer bottle thermometer, which I, I have shown, and I showed the, the picture Federico had of that one. And that one, there's a couple of things I really love about that one. So first of all, to be able to demonstrate uh, a working thermometer and calibrate it to measure to the nearest degree, like if you bother calibrating, is a pretty powerful thing to be able to do. But how I came up with the idea... It was before I started traveling around looking for experiments. It was the end of a sabbatical year where I had biked around South America, mainly working in agriculture to, to learn Spanish and to learn about agriculture. And by chance, I ended up volunteering at a school in Cusco, Peru, for a couple of weeks. And they were doing arts and crafts and they were doing computers. And like, because I knew how to use a computer, they're like, oh, can you teach the computer course? And I was like, oh, computers are boring, but OK, can't I do experiments instead? And they, they said, no, we, we, we don't have any equipment to do experiments. I said, that, that's not a problem. You can make your own equipment. So we started making things like we, we, we'd take bottles and we'd cut them in half. So we'd have a, you know, something you could use as a beaker or the top half could be a funnel. And we did like filtration, chromatography with paper towels. We made sets of rulers just taking cardboard and then wood and marking off the, the centimeters and stuff. Like we made a lot of a lab equipment, but I was always thinking this, this is limited. I, I want something that like you wouldn't think you can just, you know, cut something in half. So I, I got the idea to make a thermometer and I was thinking of gas thermometers and I wanted to make one like the problem for me with a regular gas thermometer, how, how I learned to do it in the laboratory, you'd have like a test tube in the bottle. You'd have a straw, uh, tube going down into that. But if, if you turn it upside down, it would all spill out. In the end, the solution I came up with, it doesn't work upside down either, but it still is a bit more robust. And it's just using a balloon as a reservoir of water. And I was so confident it would work, but I couldn't find where to buy balloons in Cusco. I, th there must be somewhere that you can. Like now that I'm more resourceful, I'm sure I could find balloons if I, I went there. But I was dreaming about this thermometer for like two weeks, three weeks uh, during the rest of my travels until I got back to Paris. And like when I got back to Paris, as, as soon as uh, I got back, I got a balloon, put the thermometer together. It worked well and started sharing it with students. And I, I founded a, a science club at my school that we called the Homemade Lab Project. And we were trying to make all kinds of homemade lab equipment. And that was kind of like the the main experiment where I'd go, go around to classes recruiting students. I was like, look at this one. Uh, and then since then, like, 
I had students join me going to Ghana. And in some of the schools we made them, the students there hadn't seen a functioning thermometer, like because they wouldn't have lab thermometers in the school or at home. So we were able to actually show the functioning of a thermometer to kids who hadn't seen one function before. So like for all those reasons, that's probably my all time favorite experiment. Um, but it's not one that I really learned from someone else. So I'm kind of like disappointed because I like talking about things I've learned from other people. So that's why I wanted two answers, but that was a pretty long story. Were there other questions we should get to? And if, the, if there weren't, then I'll get to the other experiment that I have the materials for ready now. If, you know, thanks, you thanks, Michael. Actually, there was just uh, one note. If you could add the list of items that you used for the experiment, perhaps we could uh, add, uh, add a slide on that um, in the presentation. So everyone oh, would, uh, would have it. Yeah, yeah. Does uh, does it make sense if I do that afterwards and anyone interested goes back to the slide and they'll look for? Of and, course, we can do that. And and also like related to that, but a lot less immediate for that. That's also the plan with the how to guide to accompany the script that's planned to be published on CERN's website. Um, so like because that that's the obvious question. Everyone's like, but what materials did you use? Um, so yeah, uh, I'll write up the list and because it's quicker talking than writing, I'll just recap quickly showing the things. So like trash can, that's visually obvious. The aluminum foil, uh, pie plates, ethanol that I diluted with a little bit of water. So this is the diluted one that I need to remember not to drink from before because like in a lot of countries, they add chloro de benzoalcoholinico. Don't know how to translate that, but it's not something you want to drink. That's why they added to it. Uh, and then the key thing was the three salts, uh, which were sodium chloride, potassium chloride, and boric acid. Um, and you could use any, well, any metal salts, no, not any metal salts. But one of the reasons why I used chlorides, other than like sodium chloride and potassium chloride, they're edible and you can get them from the grocery store and they're, they're cheap. Um, but also chlorides dissociate more easily, so you'll more easily get a flame than if you're using uh, like chlorates, nitrates. Nitrates dissolve a bit better, um, so I've tried those as well, but chlorides are a little bit better and, and they're cheaper. The, yeah. Going into a bit of detail about those materials, because that's the more complicated part where there might be some thinking or like people might think, well, where do I get that? Do I have that in the lab? And then boric acid, I hadn't thought of using it until I was in Kazakhstan with my friend Nasco, who's the science on stage ambassador for Bulgaria and an absolute genius and a brilliant chemist. And he suggested it uh, because it's highly soluble and uh, it's cheap and easy. Uh, but that, that's not one I would have thought of on my own. I, I, I was using a copper salt because I really like the copper color. But to go with the storyline of like three powders that look the same, then boric acid fits a lot better than that. But like copper has a brighter green color, like green blue color. But still, overall, boric acid is my favorite for that one. Thank you, Michael, for explaining. Uh, there was one question uh, from Emmanuel asking if you plan to do something with the application of AI. Oh, that's that's a good question. Everyone's talking about AI uh, these days. Um, the short answer is, I don't think I'll get around to it in the near future. It, it's not that it's not interesting or not worth looking into. There's definitely a lot of things that can and are being done with it. Um, it's just, um, yeah, I, I haven't gotten around to playing with it enough to, um, have anything much interesting to say on it, but I, I probably will at some point. Of course. And uh, since we do have five more minutes, I wanted to, to ask everyone in case you have any questions for, for Michael, you're free to, to ask in the chat. But uh, Michael, perhaps you would also like to, to share something about your experiments. Yeah, while we do, wait. Uh, do, do, do you want to see my other favorite one and the story behind it? Why not? <laughs> Perfect. OK, and I'll, I'll my earphones just to grab something else for this. So this one I learned from a student, and this is one of the reasons why I love sharing this one, because it allows me to remind us of the point that 
we can and should learn from students. Not not all the time and not everything any student has to say is brilliant, but we can learn from them and we can learn along with them. And it started with my favorite homework and it's a homework I encourage all of you to do for students. And the homework is just to research an experiment, come to class and show an experiment to teach the others about something. And the skills they learn through that, then they need to look things up or find something, find materials, try it out. If it doesn't work, then get it to work. They might have people around their home asking, what are you doing? Why do you need those things? So they end up communicating about science and experiments as well. So there's a whole range of things they learn. And then when they get to class, sometimes you can learn new things too. And I often say, if it's like a one in a thousand idea, that like, you know, if that's the rate at which a student would show me an absolutely brilliant experiment, then it's worth asking 30 students per class every month or two. So you'd have like five or 10 times 30 per uh, per year times whatever number of classes you have, maybe a thousand experiments per year. And then every year you get a one in a thousand experiment that's worth sharing on. Uh, so even though students are less dense uh, a repository for ideas than teachers, you can learn from them too. So the homework was due. This kid went into his lunch uh, lunchbox, pulled out a water bottle, pulled out two drinking straws. This was before straws were going extinct. Uh, I'm gonna grab colored ones so you can see them. These ones have traveled a lot, um, so they're, they're getting a little bit uh, roughed up. And then he pulled out a page from his notebook, but I prefer pulling out a guest scientist. So some of you might, recognize this guy. This is Nikola Tesla. And so you probably know that Tesla was a genius. You, oh, am I, are, are we losing me? Am I still here? No, no, it's all good. I just moved the presentation so it's bigger for everyone. Oh, perfect. Thank you. We thought of it this time. Okay, so going on and saying, not only is Tesla a genius, he's generous. So if I ask him for some electrons, he won't just give a couple, but he'll give billions and billions of electrons. So I'm just going to take some electrons from Tesla's face here. So now these straws have gotten billions of billions of electrons from Tesla. And as I approach them, we, as I, they're very old and when they get old, they're less round. And when they're less round, they don't move so easily. But if you find the sweet spot, we can still demonstrate repulsion of like charges because they're both negatively charged. But the fun doesn't stop there because Tesla, He's a genius and he's generous. He gave up electrons, so now he's positive. And being positive is attractive. So we look at the attractive, attractive Mr. Tesla, attracting the star. Need to hold Tesla a little bit better. Come on, Tesla. So Tesla attracting the star. But I don't want to be upstaged. Tesla's not the only Tesla. Come on, Tesla. Tesla's not the only attractive guy in the room. I'm also quite attractive. And that's a great way to introduce uh, static electricity. And after this kid showed me it, I was teaching two classes at the same level. The next day I did that as my experiment, like I canceled what I was otherwise planning to do because I thought that that's a better way than I was going to teach it. And like two months after that, I was in Cambodia. It was one of the first places I did volunteer teaching. And there they said, we don't teach static electricity because it's too humid here. I said, oh, really? Can you find me a couple of straws? And at the, the NGO, like they worked with a couple of schools there. And uh, so I showed them and they were blown away and they're like, oh, so we can teach static electricity. And so to this day, they're now teaching static electricity in a part of the world where they claimed they couldn't just because they didn't have the right experiment to do it. Um, so that like, that makes that kind of tied for one of my all-time favorite experiments. Thank you very much, Michael, for presenting that one too. And, and I hope this time also everyone managed to, to see everything. In case uh, the list uh, for the experiments that Michael has done, then you will add it uh, again in the presentation and everyone can easily download. 
uh, since, yeah, I guess we ran out of time. Uh, we did a full hour with everyone and I hope all your answers, uh, your questions were answered and that everything was clear. Again, if you do have any questions, I'm sure Michael would also be available via his email then to, to answer. Um, in case, uh, I also wanted to say a big thank you from the Scientix team that you managed to find your time to do this and to present your course. Uh, I do hope that uh, you have uh, many new applicants and uh, thank you once again. Oh, the, thank you. This has been uh, really great and thank you for organizing it and thank you for everyone for coming along. Um, yeah, th thanks again. Good evening, everyone. Or have a good day for those that are joining from far away. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's some people on the west coast of the state. So yeah, have a great start of the day. Bye, everyone. Bye.